Are we good? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right, good. Well, we're glad to be here this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor, for the invitation. We came through here last uh, June. We were on vacation over here in Williamsburg, and um, Brother Greg and Brother Ty, got, uh, Brother Scott got together. Ty's our son-in-law, and uh, got together and invited um, Scott to preach last year. And uh, we came by, and shortly after your father had gone home to be with the Lord, and Mom had gone home to be with the Lord, and I'm looking forward to heaven. Amen. Amen. And uh, we sat right over here and enjoyed ourselves so much. The choir and the special music uh, last uh, June and again this morning. Uh, what a choir. And uh, you've got a great choir leader. Of course, he had good experience over the years. And uh, this uh, trio, we may pack them up and take them home with us. I don't think I've ever heard that song and the beautiful song. And God bless you. And uh, for your kindness, we had a great time last night. Uh, I don't know if I fit in with all the camouflage or not, but uh, I, uh, I came along and uh, was prepared to do whatever I needed to be. I had my old shoes even in the car if I needed to put them on. And, but you guys were down in the water there shooting. Uh, I thought you were fishing down there, but you weren't. You were shooting. And um, it was a wonderful evening. The food was great. I tried some things that I would not eaten before and not sure what I had, but it was good. <laughs> And uh, you guys did good. See Duck Dynasty's back in the sound room this morning. And uh, going on here, no question about it. And uh, we praise the Lord. If you'll take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 6. When we were asked to come and we talked about this special day, and when we think about marriage and we think about family, <clears throat> well, God instituted the marriage. And regardless of what our society is doing in this, in this 21st century, marriage is still God's idea. And God put man and woman together, and that's God's plan for a lifetime. And we recognize that God has the proper principles uh, for what a marriage should be. Uh, Marsha and I, we got married uh, several years ago. This August uh, the 11th will be 46 years uh, that we've been married. We both were 10 when we got married <laughs> in middle school. Yeah. And, um, but uh, Marcia was actually 18 and I was 22 uh, when we got married. Our dating began actually in church. And uh, being 19 and uh, 18 rather and her 15, no, 19 and 15. Uh, when we started setting together in church. When our daughter turned 15, we told her it would be a cold day where the booger man lives uh, before a 19-year-old would knock on this door. And uh, these were the old days. You get it? These were the old days. But uh, we had a great time together, lots of laughs and lots of things that we talk about uh, to this day. Just a few months ago, I just felt so compelled to pull out all the love letters that I had in, at the house. And uh, someone had given us a nice uh, uh, cheese and meat tray or basket, a little wicker basket-like thing about this size, very nice. And so I found all of my love letters, and I, I went through those and stacked them real nice in this uh, wicker basket. And I went to show Marsha, and I said, now, where are your love letters? <laughs> and she said, what love letters? I said, the letters I'd written you. And she said, Oh, I threw those away a long time ago. I was like, wow, we've been married all these years. I've got all of these letters back when she was 15, 16, 17, and 18 years old. And many of those were written uh, whenever she was in uh, uh, biology class or uh, chemistry or whatever. She's writing me these letters. And I guess she was afraid mom and dad would find them, so she burned mine, evidently. <laughs> Uh, but I kept mine. I want you to know, I love you so much. I kept mine. Uh, but uh, I took them to the pulpit. And she didn't know what I had. I pulled them out and set them right up on the pulpit. And I just began to go through them and read the, a few lines out of them. And then I got down to, whoops, I got to skip that line. But um, I had an old card. I'll share this before we look at the, the principles. And we've got a magic formula that we put together 
on how a marriage ought to work for 46 years and how you raise children properly. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, we're going to look into God's Word at a very simple principle and a simple verse that will help us all this morning, I pray. But um, for several years, talking to Marsha over the phone and telling her that I love her, she could not tell me back uh, that she loved me. Uh, first of all, her mom would be sitting there when I called. <laughs> and then uh, they were on a party line. And how many know what a party line is? Let's say, okay, how many do not know what a party line is? And you're wondering about what is a party line? Well, it's kind of like Facebook. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, where everybody knows your business because they're... You, you dial a phone line and there's like five different families in the neighborhood that are on that same party line. And uh, your ring would be three rings and a short or two rings, two short rings and a long ring. That's your ring. You know your own distinctive ring. You would pick it up. And so when I would call Marcia, she would pick up and I'd hear three or four more pick up. <laughs> and then mommy's sitting beside of her and the old car that I had to get rid of, my, my nice car, I had to get rid of because a lot of things, and primarily her daddy wouldn't let her ride with me in the car, but I bought a, a four-cylinder Datsun, a Nissan, and it was a piece of junk. And um, at any rate, I had trouble with it from day one. And so Marcia would always, the code word was, whenever she would tell me, I love, me, love you, she'd say, how's your Datsun? And... Uh, so I would say, I love you. She says, how's your Datsun? And even to this day, when she says, how's your Datsun? It's just something just goes all, all over me. Like, it's just, it's so thrilling. Uh, the car had so many problems, though. Seriously, it had so much problems with this old car uh, that it got to the point where her mom and dad was asking, how's your Datsun? And I'm like, <laughs> so I love you, too. You know, that's uh, what all do you say? But... Uh, so we have a, a, lot of, a lot of memories, and, um, and thank God for it, and it's all the Lord. We were, all, we were so young, and, uh, but uh, God was uh, so good to us in such a special way. Let's stand. Would you read with me this verse? As you read this verse, Matthew chapter 6, we'll begin reading, if you would please, in verse number 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in the dark, that, that excuse me, that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. And therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat in the body, more than or than Ramit. Notice verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Would you read verse 33 with me? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the Mara, for the Mara shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil and thereof. 
We'll be looking this morning just simply at this verse and verse 33. Father, bless now, I pray, the reading, the study of thy word. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have the recall that we need to have to say only what needs to be said for this time. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to every heart in this room, the young and old alike, and recognize that there are husbands and wives that are here raising their children many that are grandparents and those again that are in those families. And I pray, God, that you would speak to each of us at this verse today in a very special way, knowing that this is the key ingredient uh, for a family and for a marriage uh, to be Christ-honoring. Uh, Lord, we'll thank you for what you'll do in this hour, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. And all God's people said, Amen. You've heard the old saying, and that you never get too old to learn. Uh, well, this is a lesson, again, that I think all of us have heard, but you'll never get too old uh, to learn for sure. The Bible says, so teach us uh, to number our days uh, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. As I think about how quickly time passes away, I recognize that God wants us to follow His perfect will, not just that one time, but continually throughout our entire life. I was saved as an 18-year-old boy. I grew up in a preacher's home. I was saved after high school, was baptized when I was seven years of age, but I never had a born-again experience. And by the way, you can grow up in a preacher's home, you can grow up religious, and you can grow up even being baptized, but not have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was after those years of the preacher's home that I recognized that I had a need of a Savior. And the Lord Jesus Christ, through a chain of events, got my attention and showed me that I had never truly been born again. And I thank God for that day uh, that I trusted Christ. As I began to think about life itself and think about what I was going to do in my life, it was an amazing thing that God began to put things in place. And I recognize as I look back, God was in every bit of that. Uh, for it was after I settled down, it was after I come again to myself and my life was changed, uh, that God allowed my path to cross uh, with my dear wife at a young age and we began to court. Uh, someone uh, has observed that life is uh, like a dollar bill. Uh, you can spend it on what you want, uh, but you can only spend it once. Uh, you can spend it and invest it, or you can spend it and waste it. There's been a lot of wasted years in my life. As an 18-year-old boy, I look back, uh, but I'm glad that at an early age still that I was able to invest in something that was for all of eternity. Uh, whether you're uh, young or old in this group today, whether you're a teenager or 60-plus years of age or whatever the case may be, I want you to know you can make the best days of your life still be the rest, day, the rest of your life, be the best days of your life. Amen. Uh, just simply by following this simple principle found in this passage of Scripture. Uh, you know, you never uh, come to the place where you think that you've arrived and you think that you know it all. And uh, we look back over our lives and we wonder uh, how God has blessed us in such an unusual way. And my father was an old-time Baptist preacher. My dad and your dad, they have a lot of similarities. And, and I, we talked about that. It's an interesting thing how God allows our paths uh, to cross. Uh, but I think about uh, the, the times in, in my life as a, as a preacher's kid. And I think about all that dad had taught me. And I rebelled against those things. But it's an amazing thing how those things will come back to you. Uh, when you get your heart right with the Lord. And I thank God for my father. Thank God for my mother and what they invested in us. Uh, but when I look at our life, Marsha and I uh, courted and wrote our letters and talked on the phone and all of those kind of things, sat in church, and a uh, very simple a time of courting. Uh, but uh, we knew what we desired to do in our life, and that was to serve the Lord. We didn't know how, we didn't know what we would be doing, but we just wanted to be obedient to the Lord. And so when we said, I, I do, August the 11th, 1973, at an altar, I not only made a vow to my wife 
but we made a vow to the Lord. Amen. And from that day forward, we claimed this verse, this simple verse, as our theme for our marriage and for our home. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You notice it says, but seek, mm -hmm. but seek the Lord. Whatever you're going through in your life and whatever stage you are in your life, uh, may I encourage you just to grab a hold of this principle uh, that God has given us in his word. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. I know that sounds so simple uh, when you hear this say, first things first, uh, but I want to tell you uh, today that this is the key, seek ye first. Yes. I want you to write three things down and then I'll be done, okay? If you'll listen fast, I'll talk fast. <laughs> and first of all is the principle. And just put out from that, that word seek, or you can underscore it in your Bible. And just seek. The word means to covet earnestly, to strive after, to actively pursue, to go after something again that you have a passion for. It's in the present tense. It means continuously, every day of your life, that you ought to seek. Definitions suggest a serious... This verb indicates a continual, constant action. When the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what does that mean? It means to, keep, to seek the king supremely. Allowing, again, the Lord Jesus Christ full authority of our life. Amen. To give him all of ourselves. And James chapter 4 and verse number 8 says, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. By the way, you can be as close to the Lord as you desire to be. Yes. And there are a lot of people who so say, I just wish I, I, I knew that. I, I wish I had that. I wish I, I could say that. I wish I could be used of the Lord. By the way, it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. Yes. It's about being filled with the Spirit yes. of God, being under the control of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when I got saved as an 18-year-old boy and, and uh, was able to, to land a job with a great success and, and thank God for that. Uh, but during that period, I remember uh, that I was hiring some people for this company and, and traveled for them. And I had this young man uh, that had a Pentecostal background. He said, so when did you get saved? And I told him when I was 18 and gave him my testimony. And he looked at me and he said, well, Roger, have you ever got the Holy Ghost? And I said, oh, no, we don't believe in that. And uh, little did I understand as a young Christian uh, that it wasn't about me having the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost having me. Amen. It's about the Holy Ghost, again, having full control of my life. And be ye not drunk with wine, wherein it is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. I, as a child of God, to recognize it's about yielding ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Scripture reminds us, again, to draw nigh to God. How can I draw nigh to God by being emptied out of self and allowing the Holy Spirit to have full control of my life. And the Bible reminds us in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 and ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with your heart. Yes. It's about trusting Jesus Christ uh, for your destiny. You see I have no idea what I may face along this journey but I know what my destiny is. And if I'm going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, that means that I'm going to trust Him every day of my life. For we walk by faith, not by sight. I turn, would you please, to the book of Romans, chapter number 3. A very familiar text to us all, no question about it. And as you read this passage, you'll find in verse number 11, the Bible says, There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Uh, but yet the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What does he mean that there is none that seeketh after God? May I say it is God that is seeking after us. Yes. God has you here this morning for a reason. God allows you to cross paths with someone else that the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart. It is God, again, that is speaking to us. 
You say, well, I was searching for something in my life. Well, God got you to that place where you realized that life was empty apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is God, again, that's in control, and God is the one that's doing the seeking. But as you read here in Romans chapter 3, look at verse number 21. The Bible says, but now the righteousness of God without the law was manifested, but being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Verse 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remissions of remission of sins and that are passed through the forbearance of God. Notice verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. You see, it's about seeking the Lord by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, and thou shalt be saved. It's not only about trusting Christ again for salvation, but trusting Him for our destiny. Christ's righteousness is the forgiveness of sin is what we find here. But it's about trusting Him in our daily life. In our text, we understand again that there's a lot of things that people worry about. We worry about job. We worry about clothing. We worry about things. We worry about paying the bills. We worry about our health. We worry about all of these things. Uh, but the Bible reminds us to cast all of our care upon Him. Why? For He careth for you. Amen. And so as a child of God, it's by placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as husband and wife as we would come together. May I say it's not about what I can do, but it's what Christ can do through me as I yield myself yeah. to Him. Amen. And so may I say to you today for a principle uh, for every home, it begins by seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Mm -hmm. And all these things shall be added unto you. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 says, Not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, If ye then be in risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Our children growing up, Marsh and I, we're married in 73. Scott was born in 76. Stacy was born in 80. It's an amazing thing how quickly those years have gone by. And now we have grandchildren, six grandbabies. Each of them have three. Uh, someone told me, how many grandparents do we have in the room today? Would you raise your hand? Oh, look at this. Wonderful, is it not? Someone said that your grandchildren are your reward for not killing your children. <laughs> and there have been many times... But thank God for grandchildren. There's nothing like them. Nothing like them. And we realize when we all get together, God has certainly blessed us. But as I said to the men this morning, and the fact is in my own life, and Marcia would say the same thing, her mom and dad were devout Christians and serving in the church as long as I have known them. Ironically, my dad and her dad were friends from way back her grandmother used to attend my dad's church years ago where he pastored. Little did we know all of that. But they were friends way back. They are godly people. And so God put us together. Uh, but we recognize again that in all of that, uh, may I say, God was leading. God was directing. And I think about what we enjoy this day, as I said to the men. We're enjoying the blessings today and the favor of God on our life because of the faithfulness of our own parents. Amen. And you know what I want to leave to our grandchildren? Yeah. That goodly heritage. Yeah. Uh, that favor of God upon their life uh, by us remaining consistent uh, with the Lord. And again, following this simple principle. The Bible reminds us that in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. <laughs> There are a lot of decisions that we've made in life that we'd like to go back and do over. But the Lord allowed us to make some good choices along the way. A.W. Tozer said, the choices we make today determine who we are tomorrow. 
and how true that is. And not only who I'm going to be tomorrow, but who my children are going to be uh, tomorrow. And so the choices along the way are so important. And sometime, Marsh and I found, along with the kids, that it was just some simple things, uh, some very simple practical things of making those choices based upon this passage of Scripture. You know, it wasn't things that were wrong. It wasn't things that was going to send somebody to hell. But it was just a simple principle uh, that we wanted to instill into our children. And so I urge you this morning, as you think about this one word, seek, it's about putting forth that extra effort uh, to make sure that every decision that we make, uh, that that's all weighed out. Would the Lord be pleased with this? Is this what the Lord would allow uh, for us to do in my life? Not only for our time, but also for our children's time. And so it begins with that simple principle, seek. Uh, but look at the second word there, seek ye first, underscore the word first, meaning there is a priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And Jesus Christ does not want a place in your life. He wants prominence Amen. in your life. I hear some of these sports figures and, and those on TV that uh, they interview and say, well, the first thing I want you to know is that God has a big part in my life. Well, that's all nice. And I'm glad to hear them at least acknowledge God. Amen? Yeah. In the day in which we live. Yes, but God wants more than just a part. Yeah. Of your life. Uh, by the way, he is the priority. He needs to be the preeminent one yeah. in our life. Let's turn, would you please, to Colossians here, chapter 1, verse number 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have what? The preeminence. God desires to have preeminence in our life. He doesn't want just part of your day. He wants all of your day. Amen. He doesn't want part of your life. He wants all of your life. Uh, let me encourage you to follow this priority in your own life, your daily life. Give the Lord those first few moments of every day. Those first few moments. He wants the first part of your paycheck indeed. He wants the first of your life. He wants the first of everything that you're doing. It's about seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these Things shall be added unto you, seeking for the glory of the Lord. Everything that we do ought to glorify the Lord. You know, others are indeed watching our life. And they, again, need to see Christ in us. It may be the only Bible that they ever read. For the Bible does say your epistles read of all men. Uh, but most importantly, I have a responsibility now uh, for a son and now a daughter. I remember when my wife got pregnant and my boss, he would kid her. We would go to dinner and, and different things and visit with them. And, and he would say to Marsha, you're going to have a peanut. You're going to have a peanut. She gained a total of like uh, 12 pounds when, when, Scott was, when she was pregnant with Scott. 12 pounds. And uh, Paul, my friend, he kept saying, Marsha's going to have a peanut. Marsha's going to have a peanut. And that was back in the day when it wasn't the right thing for the man to go inside, you know, the, uh, the maternity ward and all of that, where all of that was taking place. I'm so glad that wasn't there then, you know, because <laughs> I would have never made it, no question about it. But I've, I'm out in the lobby. How many agree with me? You men agree with me? I'm out in the lobby, you know, pacing back and forth and waiting for this son. We didn't know what it was. We didn't know whether he's... Uh, a boy or a girl, and, and I'm thankful we didn't, but we're waiting, we're waiting, you know, and finally they tell me to meet in the, in the hallway, and she's going to be coming down on the, 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 uh, the cot, and as they're rolling her through, you know, putting her on the elevator and taking her upstairs, and so I'm out there waiting anxiously. Here comes Marsha, and the, they're pushing her down the hallway, and she looks up at me, she's all groggy, she's like, I didn't have a peanut. <laughs> 
And that's the first thing she said. I didn't, I didn't have a peanut. And uh, if you look at Scott now, you know she didn't have a peanut. But, you know, that, that day changed our lives again. It's one thing to get married and look for children, but when you have that firstborn, it's like this is a brand new day. And what are we going to do? And, oh, what a responsibility. Oh, we just go back to this verse. Seek ye first the yeah. kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And you say, preacher, that's not very theologically deep. That's not really, that's really not so doctrinal. I, I need something more. I want you to know it's just a simple principle, amen? And the priority is here just by giving all to the Lord. And again, surrendering, saying, Lord, I, I give you everything. It all belongs to you. I'm just the steward. And it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And you see, everything that we have, it belongs to the Lord. It not only means that all that we do would glorify the Lord, but also seeking the guidance of the King. Every morning of your life, it ought to begin by asking Jesus again, asking the Lord for direction in your, in your life. There's many times that maybe people think I'm talking to myself. I was going down the road the other day, and I looked over, and this guy, he was getting down. I mean, he was like at the red light. I mean, he was just, he, no one else was in sight. He didn't think about anybody else. And he's bebopping, and he's just, you know, giving it everything. And you could, you could hear uh, the, the booming on the, on the fenders and <laughs> shattering your glass as well, you know. And, but you, this guy wasn't ashamed at all. And I got to thinking about that as I pulled away from the stoplight. And that how many times have I just been talking to the Lord and it's just me and him and I'm praising God. We ought not be ashamed. The others are not ashamed yeah. uh, to lift up their voice and, and cry out and sing out. Uh, we ought to just spend time yeah. with the Lord. Amen. Not just at the beginning of the day, but throughout the day. Yeah. I've asked the Lord, no, Lord, you're going to have to help me, Lord. Help me to say the right things. Lord, help me to respond. Lord, help me again uh, to learn some principles in my life. The principles that I've learned, help me to apply those. Help me, Lord. Guide me, Lord. I need you, Lord. Yes. And I'm glad the Bible is clear that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And not that I'm good, but he's righteous. He's good. And his righteousness has been imputed into me. And as we follow him by faith, uh, the Lord wants to guide us yes. into all truth. Uh, but may I say, seeking the Lord is more than seeking glory for the Lord in my life, seeking guidance for the Lord in my life but also seeking his government in my life, allowing him to be under full control, and that I would be a loyal subject to the king, Amen. and that I would be controlled by the king. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17, those that seek me early yes. shall find me. Yes. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. We see the principle here. We see the priority here. And then lastly, oh, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, would you finish it for me? And all these things shall be what? Added unto you. We see the promise. Yeah. The promise is clear. You compare that with Matthew 6, 25, there in your text, and you see, therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? He speaks of the birds and the lilies and the grass of the field. He speaks here again of taking care of his own. And may I say, God's going to take care of you as well. Amen. Yes. We were seeking the Lord, putting God again, his rightful place in our life and every decision that we were making. Marcia's a nurse and she chose not to go back into nursing. She chose again to raise the children. And at a certain age, he planned again to go back into nursing. That was the plan. But we were just following the Lord. We were always involved in our church, and God was working uh, in our church, and we saw many wonderful things happen. My daddy began preaching when he was 13 years of age, and he went to heaven when I was 22. We had been married nine months when my father passed away at age 57, giving his life completely to the Lord. My father, when he died, he didn't leave really anything behind. And we lived in church parsonages most of my life as a kid. Traveled, moved around a little bit. But the hospital, when they gave us the clothing, they gave me my dad's wallet. 
And I opened up my dad's wallet and I found my dad's ordination card in his wallet, his driver's license, his social security card, a couple pictures of the family, and tucked away in the back of that billfold, I found three pennies. Three pennies. And I said to my brothers and my sister, five in our family, Daddy would say he had five children and all of them were girls but four. <laughs> but at any rate, so I showed them the billfold and I showed them these three pennies and I said, this is the sum of Dad's inheritance and I'm not going to share it. <laughs> I took those three pennies and I scotch taped them in the family Bible at the house, have them to this day. Daddy's been gone since 1974. And those three pennies are a reminder to me that life doth not consist in the abundance of things. And knowing again it's not about all that you can gain in this life. God had blessed us in a tremendous way. I was in sales and when Scott was just a year old, I was offered a promotion of a lifetime that I didn't really see coming at all. I received this promotion and things were going well and I started traveling for the company and God began to bless even more. And things were going well, good benefits, good income, nice home, beautiful children, Christian school, us serving the Lord in church and we were being faithful to the Lord as we knew how to be. Not perfect, not without problems, not without uh, incidents along the way, understand that. But things were, were going well. And right in the middle of that, we'd been married 10 years. Scott was eight and Stacy was four. I woke up in the middle of the night. We had everything that we needed and more. I woke up in the middle of the night crying uncontrollably. And my heart was so heavy. And God was dealing with my heart. My wife woke up not knowing what was going on. And I said, I've got something I've got to tell you. Well, she's fearing the worst. But I finally was able to get it out that God was calling me to preach. We'd been married 10 years. The children were young. Our life was all in front of us. What are we going to do? And I never will forget what Marcia said. She said, well, let's pray. And whatever God wants you to do, and you're obedient to him, I'm going to follow you. Amen. You see, here's the principle again. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Yes. I'm not suggesting that everybody's going to be called to preach, but just be obedient to the Lord. Yes, amen. And so we knelt down by the bed, and we prayed, and we asked the Lord to help us, and doors started opening up without us calling anyone about speaking out. And where my dad had preached, people, people knew my dad, and, and he had a good reputation, has a good reputation to this day. And people started calling, would you come over and preach? Would you come over and preach? We preached to 6 and 8 and 30 and 40, you know, these little churches all in West Virginia. And, and uh, Stacy, if she was here, I could embarrass her. She, she traveled churches by bathrooms, you know. She, <laughs> the first thing she did when we got in the church is find the bathroom. And she was really fooled when we got out to Odd, West Virginia. That's an odd name for a town, but that was it, Odd, West Virginia. It's where Dr. Bob Gray is from. And um, hey, she comes back and running back in after she went to the bathroom and out loud while I'm in the pulpit, Mommy, it's outside and it's got a big old hole out there. <laughs> She had never seen one of those. Uh, but we, we just were obedient to the Lord and, and um, took appointments as they came. The company worked well with me and let me uh, take some time uh, to preach and things like that. And then in 1990, a place where my daddy had pastored when I was just a kid from 1949 to 55, my two older brothers were saved there. The church called and asked, would I be willing, would I consider uh, coming? We prayed much about it, talked to family and friends and pastor and mom, and, and the, the list goes on, and we felt that's what God would have us to do. So in 1990, June of 1990, we became the pastor by vocation uh, of the Cranberry Church, where I am now to this day. And uh, we went there part-time, still working with the job, phased the job out, left the company, 
uh, after 27 years with the same company uh, in a great position. Thank the Lord for it and all of those wonderful days. But God was still in the law. Yeah. And uh, so now we've been at this church this June. will be 21 years full time that we've been at the church. And during that time, our son answered a call to preach. Our daughter went to Bible college and married a preacher. And uh, God has just blessed in a tremendous way. And uh, I can't describe, I can't say enough about how good the Lord is. Amen. Uh, but I go back to this verse and I close. Seek ye first uh, the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You see the principles here, the priority is here. And then the promises that when we're just obedient to the Lord, not everyone's going to preach, not everyone's going to be called to preach. Uh, but how do you know the will of God then, preacher, for your life? you just simply obedient to what you know to do. And the Bible says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so for every family, every child in this room that is seeking God's will in your life, it begins right here in this passage of Scripture. Yeah. And for moms and dads and those with grandchildren, it's about still seeking the Lord. And now we're praying diligently for our six grandchildren. Yeah. I believe two of those boys are going to be preachers. And we're praying that God would put his hand upon the girls, three girls and three boys, and we believe God's going to do something special in the days ahead. But it all comes back to trust in the Lord. Let's stand, would you please? Yeah. Our heads are bowed for just a moment. Your pastor's going to come. But in this room today, you'd say, Preacher, I know in my own heart, in my own life, that this principle is the main ingredient in my home. And I ask that you pray for me, pray for us as a family. Young and old alike, you may be single, but you say, I, I want to live by this principle. I, I believe this is what God is speaking to me as well from this simple text. And just by an uplifted hand, I want to follow the Lord and be obedient to Him. Would you raise your hand with mine all over this room today? Moms and dads and sons and daughters. And there may be those in the room today who do not know Christ as your Savior. And may I say, the Lord's seeking for you. You're not here by accident. And God, again, is drawing you to Himself. And we invite you to come today as the pastor comes and, and extends the invitation. God bless you. God bless you. Our heads are bowed. Eyes are closed as they begin to play. And this altar is wide open. You can't, can't claim the promises if you don't know the Lord. You can't, you can't claim these promises if you don't know the Lord. I, I am... I implore you today, trust Jesus Christ by faith as your personal Savior, please. Jesus is reaching out to you. If you, don't, if you haven't prayed and personally asked Him to save you, today's the day. You can chart a new path for your family from this moment on that will have wonderful, wonderful, wonderful repercussions for years and generations to come if you'll trust Him. I'll say like I told the men earlier this morning, you know, I wouldn't be the pastor of, your church, of this church. I would not be your pastor if my mom and dad hadn't made some very important decisions in their life. That decision dictates what I do every single day. How about that? Maybe not every decision we make is that important, but we make some pretty important decisions, don't we? Today you ought to come and ask God to lead and guide you in those decisions. Are you seeking the Lord in them? Are you letting him guide you? Again, you can't enjoy the promises unless you do that. And may God lead and guide us in all of it. They're playing. The altar's wide open. I'd encourage husbands and wives to come and pray together. Parents and children to seek the Lord together in this altar this morning. If you're waiting for us to sing, you're waiting too long. You come and ask God to help you. Oh, we're going to pray for our children. How would you feel if your children had the same marriage that you have? How would you feel about that? How would you feel if your grandchildren had the same family life uh, that you have? Do you want better for them? We ought to pray for it today. We do our best to encourage them all the way through. It's 305 in the hymn book. We'll sing a verse of it together. As we sing, you come and do business with the Lord. 305, you join and sing with me. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee. For cleansing in thy 
precious blood that flowed on Calvary. I am coming, Lord, coming now to Thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Though coming we can vile, Thou dost my strength assure. Thou dost my vileness fully cleanse till spotless, all and pure. I am coming, Lord, coming now to Thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. I'm going to ask Brother Caleb to come along and lead us in this closing prayer as we make ready for this baptism. But I hope that you'll, 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 you'll take these truths and apply them to your heart. Friend, don't waste this truth. Excuse me for getting excited, excited about it. Don't waste it. Amen. Do not rest on your laurels when it comes to your family. Don't do it. Don't do it. None of us are that strong. If you and I don't understand how much Satan is after you, he wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to rip your family apart. And some of us know what that's all about. We must seek God with all of our heart. Yes. And I know Satan's after everybody, but he'd love to get in a church like this and tear us apart at the seams. Hey, and some of us know, and some of us can say, thank the Lord, we've been to the edge and back, and God has rescued us. Amen? Amen. And, but I want you to take it seriously today. We're not doing this for kicks and giggles. It's a shame to say that divorces and homes being ripped apart is just as rampant inside of God's house as is outside of it. And it's because we're not seeking the Lord first, we're seeking self. So I say with all of my heart, if you think this wasn't for you today, it was. It is. Yes. Take it. Use it. Live it. Live it. And I want you to know this. And we're supposed to pray. I know that, but I got something to say. I want you to know this. Well, did you look at me for a minute? Don't bow your head. Look at me for a minute. I want to say something to you just like it was me and you in the room by ourselves. If you get in trouble in your family and in a room like this, that's going to happen. Okay? If you get in trouble with your wife, you get in trouble with your husband, you have trouble with your children, I want you to know you don't need to hide that from me. You don't need to hide it from this church. You need to have discretion. I want you to know that you need to have discretion, but let us help you. Amen. Don't be so foolish to think you're going to ride it out. Right. The longer you do nothing, the worse it will get. I can speak from experience. The longer you do nothing, the worse it will get. And there are no perfect marriages and there are no perfect families. But I'm telling you, it's like we're in the room by ourselves together. I want you to know. If it gets bad and it gets ugly, you can come talk to us about it. Amen. That's good. Please do it. It's embarrassing, but it's better to be embarrassed than to have the whole thing be thrown away. But I want you to know that's why we're here. So if you understand what I say today, say amen. Amen. I want you to know, and you don't, you think, and I don't have all the answers. The Lord has them in his Bible. But I'm saying we can work together on it. If I can't help you, I can get you somewhere I can help you. And we can work together in the church. And we're here for one another. Don't hide your family problems. Amen. Use discretion. But let's get out there and work on them together. Okay? You just made a promise to me. You said amen. I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to hold you to it the best I can with God's grace. Because it's that important to the Lord. And thank the Lord for it. Brother Caleb, I want you to come along and lead us in a prayer. And I ask our ushers to be ready. And uh, we're going to take an offering for our brother today. He has helped us. I'm going to tell you what, he's helped me. And it got me stirred up. I want to preach a while. So when you're preaching like that, it makes me want to preach. Uh, but I want my home to be what God wants it to be. My wife deserves a better husband. I'm going to tell you that right now. My kids deserve a better father. I'm glad I feel that way about it because that keeps me working at it. And the Lord's good. Brother Caleb, if you'll help us, I'll get out of your way and then we'll take this off. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Oh, you're so good. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, as we think about the things that we've heard this morning, both in Sunday school and this evening, Lord, you're, you're so faithful and you're so good. And I thank you for the things that we've heard, the conviction. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to take these things to heart. 
Lord, help, help us to be better men, better fathers, better, better wives, just better families for you. And I pray that you would help us to seek you first, Lord, with all of our heart. Lord, I pray that you would help us in this. And Lord, I pray that you would bless, bless this offering and use it. Lord, I pray, I thank you for Brother Polly and Pastor Polly preaching to us this morning. I pray that you would use this to encourage him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Savannah Brandon. We love her family. Amen. We love Savannah. And thank the Lord, a few weeks ago, Savannah came to me very quietly in my office. But she came to me and she said, Preacher, I got saved. I got saved. And her mom and daddy had the privilege and the pleasure to lead her to Jesus. And I'm glad for that, aren't you? Amen. We pray for our children, and I'm glad when they come to know the Lord. And Savannah, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? And I want to baptize you today. I baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried with Christ in baptism. Oh, good. Here we go. Raised to walk in newness of life. If you'll pray for us, say amen. amen. Let's stand together. Be dismissed in just a moment. Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? Amen. And I am enjoying this day. This is a blessed day. Glad to have our friends the Paul is with us. And to my brother Kate, if you don't mind to help them, we'll have them at the back door. And we'll give them the right hand of fellowship on the way out. And uh, we've had a good day so far. I want you to be back tonight. I want to remind you that we're having this Valentine banquet to help support our teenagers. And don't forget about this parenting session today at 5 o'clock. We'll meet over in the second building. I believe that's room 204. We'll be out there. You'll see us. And I'll have some coffee for you. How about that? That may help some of you to come on out. That'll help parents and grandparents and others that are interested. In any way, you're welcome to be there. It'll be a chance to ask some questions, and we all need some help in that area. I know I'm excited about being there as well. If you still need those tickets, you can get them out here today to help our young people. Let's be back in the Lord's house tonight. We'll start at 6 o'clock with the banquet, so a little bit earlier than normal. If you've been glad to be in the Lord's house today, say amen. Amen. Very good. We're going to bow our heads in a word of prayer. And be dismissed. Father, thank you for what you've done in our hearts today. We thank you for Savannah trusting you and giving a public profession of her faith today. Pray you'd bless her all the days of her life. God, guide her and guard her. I pray that she would give her heart to you over and over in a sense, Lord, she just keeps following and saying yes. And thank you that she's begun this journey with you. Help our church to be a good shepherd to her. I pray you bless her home and her family. And thank you, Lord, for our friends, the Paulies, being here today. And the way you're using them, I pray protect the homes in this church. And Lord, what I said a few moments ago, I mean it. I pray you'd protect us, but Lord, help us not to hide and just wait for it to get better. I pray, God, you'd work it out so we can help each other and encourage each other with the right spirit, using the right discretion. But Lord, I, I pray.